en die winter is weer op ons, gaan jylle moes diep gaan krap met van die trui en die baaikie soos ek, nee, want hulle was nie na by nie, maar sê dankie heren vir die reen, amen, my is brood nodig, raai grasberg van my, amen, well let's get straight into the word this morning, and the title of my message this morning is let heaven come, amen, so the year 2020 past the art is declared for us as a vision, it's the year of heaven, and we're going to pray and trust God that heaven will invade our lives, that heaven will invade the earth, that heaven will invade our church, and that heaven will invade every area of your life where you might find yourself. Amen? Amen? Jylle gaat saam my werk volgen, want ek gaan nie, ek gaan nie die hemel op jylle afgooi nie, jylle gaan die hemel aftrek saam met my. Amen? Because that's what the Bible says we can do. And so, in studying the concept or the doctrine of heaven, I found it a bit challenging, and I'll explain to you why. But before we get there, let's just open up with a scripture verse this morning, and that will be our scripture verse for this entire series. And this is the start of a brand new series, Let Heaven Come. And this morning, I'm just going to lay a foundation of what heaven is, and what we could look forward to, and what heaven could be like, or what heaven would be like on earth. And then the next coming weeks, we're going to talk about and discover how we can bring this heaven into earth, how we can bring this heaven into our lives and what that would look like and how do we do that based upon scripture, based upon what God says. And so Matthew 6 from verse 9, it says, in this manner, therefore pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, from the onset, that is the scripture verse that we're going to apply for the rest of the series. But I also want you, from this day to every day, read that portion of scripture until the end of the year. And I promise you, you're going to see that scripture manifest in your life as it transforms you, as it starts to work in your heart, as it starts to work at your mind. You will see heaven manifest in your life. So make a note of that. Every home cell, we're going to open with a scripture every Wednesday. Doesn't matter what the verse is that we're covering for the sermon that we prepped, we're going to cover that verse first. We're going to pull heaven down into our families. We're going to pull heaven down into our home cells. We're going to pull heaven down into our businesses and our careers. So take this scripture, and I encourage you as a family, read it every day. In your business, before you start, open up with that scripture every day, and you'll see heaven manifest in everything that is attached to the scripture. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what Jesus prayed. And in that is the clue for us of what our lives could be here on earth and what our lives could look like here on earth. Because a lot of us are living for a place called heaven to get there someday, to get rid of all this hatred and negativity and corruption and sin and death and sickness and disease and heartache and heartbreak. We want to get rid of it, but we forget that we could have heaven on earth. So I'll prove to you that Belinda Carlisle was right. Heaven is a place on earth. Daniel thinks that. Ah, amen. Get you Amen. And you jongens gaan Google op. Now I've been excited about this message and this series ever since Dream Week last year when Pastor Art declared that this is going to be the year of heaven. And, it's, and, I, and I wasn't just excited for your part. I must be honest, I was excited mostly for my part. Because heaven as a subject matter is not something I've really studied and in depth or that I've researched much about. I'll be honest, as a pastor, I haven't studied it much. That's a concept that I speak of and it's a concept that I refer to in my sermons and refer to in encouraging people to consider to accept Christ calling them to salvation, but it's not something I've really, in my entire life of being a pastor, have really studied in depth. And in my search, I found that all the good content 
it's biblically sound and doctrinally correct, much of that context not that context's not in print anymore. And you can't find them. And some of the other content really paints heaven as a place that I don't want to go to. Amen. Ever heard someone say something about heaven and they sound all excited about it and you feel guilty that you, didn't fi- that you don't find it that exciting? Is it just me? So people's viewpoints on heaven is a lot of times shaped by their viewpoints on life on earth or maybe their viewpoints on what they deem to be most important or what they deem to be pleasurable. And so we're going to try and discover what heaven really is like and what we have looking, what we have to look forward to. Because I don't want just a narrow, unappealing view of heaven that so many people paint. Because heaven is everything you can dream it can be, and then it's everything more. And there's more to heaven than you'll ever realize. There's more to heaven than your own imagination. Even if you let it go to the wildest parts, your own imagination wouldn't be able to grasp heaven. And to my surprise, my search also found and revealed that most Christians don't give heaven much thought either. When's the last time you thought on heaven? And what it might look like? And what happens there? And what goes on there? When's the last time you really sat and you thought about heaven? Because heaven is not just a place where dead people go when they leave this earth. And sadly, a lot of times that's the only viewpoint we have of heaven is our longing for those people that have left this earth because we miss them and we want to see them one day. And it's not wrong to have those thoughts because we will see those people in heaven one day. But heaven is just, more, just a lot more than a gathering place of all the saints that have passed. And yet they'll be there and we'll see them and we'll love them and hug them and spend time with them. But heaven is much more than a reunion in the sky. The main reason people don't give heaven much thought, I believe, is because it seems as though the Bible doesn't say much about heaven other than give a little clues here and there. The topic of heaven is barely touched upon in seminary. It's never really touched upon in Bible school. And in my search, I found that the Bible has far more to say about heaven than we care to search for. While at the same time, maintaining a level of secrecy and mystery as to what it could be really like. In every book of the Bible, you'll find references and talk and speak of heaven. It's in every book in the Bible. The early Jews and Christians gave heaven way much thought than we do today. As if they knew something we don't know anymore. As if they knew something that we've probably forgotten. Maybe they purposefully kept in memory things that we've let go because of our experience here on earth. It might feel like times more like hell than heaven. And hopefully this morning we'll stir up in you a longing and an excitement again and an expectation for heaven because it's a real place. It's a wonderful place. It is a good place. It is a beautiful place. It is everything that you could think it could be, and much more. I remember when Isel and I planned our first trip to Mauritius. And it's a destination that I'd longed, I'd longed to see since I was a child, and I always dreamt of Mauritius, and I saw it on pictures and on posters, and I saw it on television, and as the, with, with the onset of social media, you used to see pictures of this place this idyllic island paradise and it stirred in me a longing to go and see it, to go walk along its beaches and swim in the sea. And so with excitement, we planned this trip and we went to go see the agents. As we sat there excitedly, they showed us all the pictures of the places we could possibly go and they showed us the resorts and they showed us the idyllic spots and they showed us everything. And we were like little children Excited at the prospect of going to this island paradise. And when I got home, I'll be honest, sometimes at work, I would research Mauritius. 
look at the pictures. And the excitement in me would grow and increase and the expectation would grow and increase. And so the day came when we excitedly arrived at the airport, realizing that the time had come, this thing that we had dreamed of for so long was finally here. And so we jumped up on the plane. And we flew over the sea and I was looking all expectantly to see this island place. And then we approached the airport and we landed and we got off the plane. Did you know that every country has a smell? Do you know that? Those of you that have traveled, there's a smell to, to countries. I've, in my travels, I've experienced that peace places have a smell. Some good, but there's a, there's a fragrance to places. So as we got off the airplane, I was trying to take in the atmosphere of this place. And then our taxi driver, our tour operator, took us on a drive from the airport that's in the southern part of Mauritius. We were in the northern part, so we drove quite extensively to get to our location. And nothing that I had saw on Google and nothing that the agent told me about Mauritius prepared me for what I was seeing and what I was experiencing and what I was smelling for the first time. And some of the stuff that I did see on Google and that I did see on pictures, I saw firsthand, but somehow it was just more glorious, more amazing. And so we went to our resort and we got there. It was late at night because someone mistakenly had taken his elf bag. It looks exactly the same. And we had to wait there at the airport running around trying to figure out where this bag was. Anyway, so we got there at nighttime, but the next morning we woke up and here we were. In this place, palm trees and lush green grass and beautiful flowers and all the food you can eat in the world. A banquet and feast at night. And so, everything we had dreamt of this place was more when we got there. And so what I'm trying to say to you is if we put so much effort on destinations that we would visit here on earth for a limited time to research and study and find out all we can and it builds excitement and expectation in us, shouldn't we give me more research and effort and thinking to a place where we'll spend eternity for? Shouldn't you be studying and thinking about heaven a lot more knowing that this life is but a vapor and that you'll spend eternity in this place? I'm trying to get you to use your brain and to think and to stir up in your spirit a longing and an excitement for what the early Jews and Christians always knew. And they always spoke of it. And they always encouraged one another with the thought of heaven. Heaven's much like these destinations. We can't learn everything about them in our research. And most things we'll only experience once we get there. But our research and discoveries build our expectation and excitement at the prospect of getting there one day. Heaven is a place. And without you even knowing, your spirit longs to be in this place. There's a longing in you. Like a longing when you get home after a long trip and that sense that I'm home, that I've come back, that I'm in the place where I truly belong. And that's what heaven is going to be like, just on a whole nother level. Because when you get to heaven one day, you'll realize this is home. This is what I've been longing for. And so over the course of this series, I want to stir in you an expectation for how heaven would be one day. And what your life can be like right now if you live more heaven-minded. You know, as I went through the notes last night and this morning, I was extremely disappointed with my sermon. Don't worry. It's a good sermon. But I said to God, I said, it feels like I'm saying absolutely nothing about heaven. And yet there's so much to say. So what do you say and what do you don't say? 
And God said, that's part of the plan. It's the mystery. It's the secret things of God that are sometimes hidden to us. But we love a mystery. We love a secret. We love discovery. It's in our DNA. So God set up heaven much like that. That we'll let the adventurous spirit in us go. That we'll let our minds and our thoughts and our hearts and our spirits soar, thinking what heaven could be like. Because it felt like I haven't said really that much about heaven. Because prior to starting out the sermon and researching it, I thought, what am I going to say? Because it doesn't seem like there's that much to say. And as I studied my Bible, as I did research, I found, but there's so much to say about heaven. And so after the series, I'll tell you all the books and the study material I used to put together this sermon. I'm not going to tell you now, but I want you to stir up an expectation in your heart. Hear what the Lord says to you. And C.S. Lewis said this. Those of you who don't know, don't know C.S. Lewis, he's the writer of the Chronicles of Narnia and hosts of other books. He said this, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. The apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great Men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven, he said, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. The powerful thought, powerful illustration of every great thing that we've seen Christians do was because they were so heavenly minded. But Paul, in his exploits of spreading the gospel to the far reaches of the earth, constantly spoke of this place that he's longing to see, to be away from this body, to be away from this place. But he realized he had work to do. But in doing this work, he knew every day he was getting closer to this place called heaven. And so... If you want this life of yours to be everything it could be, not be caught up in boredom and distractions, I say to you, be more heavenly minded. What God called that and purposed that to be for us as Christians. A Christian's life should never be boring. A Christian's life should never be without purpose. A Christian's life should never be without meaning. Every day for us as Christians, we look forward to the day that we'll meet our Maker We'll meet Jesus face to face in heaven. And while that day tarries, we work to bring heaven to earth. And so give more thought of this life hereafter. And the life here right now will be everything you dream it could be. And my goal today is to shift your attention towards heaven. And so that you give it more thought. And so that you give your life more thought. So hopefully you'll see what God has to say about the place that He calls home. Amen. I hope that silence or something stirring in you. Forming a picture. Don't be afraid to form pictures and use your imagination to see what maybe is unseen. I found sometimes as Christians we're so afraid to use our brains and our imaginations fearing that it might lead to heresy or sin. But God gave you an imagination, so think about it. Think about what it could be for you. And so the book that covers the subject of heaven with more detail than most is the book of Revelation. And this might be why we know so little of heaven. Amen. It's because we spend so little time in the book of Revelation. It seems freakish. It seems like a science fiction novel when we read it. Things with eyes and all kinds of things. And dragons and it just doesn't seem real. But there's a lot of speak on heaven in this book. And if you study it and read it, you'll see clues as to what heaven could be like. And questions that you might ask are answered in this book if you just use your brain and your common sense.
But when reading the Word, we have to have a little more understanding as to the places and times and the various religious and cultural influences of the day that shaped people's belief and thinking. And also, to a degree, how people spoke. And so, this Bible that we read is a gathering of thoughts of the Word of God that He spoke, but it's also said in terms sometimes that is influenced by cultural identity and other influences. So when you read the Bible, don't just look at it and think, well, that is what it says. It says a lot more than that. You have to go a little deeper. The Jews and the early Christians spoke of the heavens. And why do you think they spoke of the heavens in plural form? I sometimes used to think they speak of the heavens because of its vastness, because it's so great and because we can't gather and fathom how much and how far it goes and how much it is. But the Jews and the early Christians spoke of the heavens because they saw heaven in three levels. The first level of heaven was the sky where the birds and the bees and all the flying creatures find themselves. So that was the first heaven to them. And the second heaven was where the stars and the sun and the moon find themselves. So that to them was the second heaven. And then thirdly, the third heaven is what they refer to as the place where God and the angels are and find themselves. And maybe you have found the term third heaven if you've ever read read your Bible. There's a term that Paul refers to, the third heaven. And I always thought, what is this third heaven? Well, the third heaven he was speaking about was the place that God inhabits. So there's no mystical reason as to the three heavens. It just makes sense. First heaven is the sky. Second heaven is space where the stars are. Third heaven is the place that God and the angels inhabit. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 2. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And all that Paul was saying is, I wasn't in the sky, I wasn't in space, I was in the place called heaven that God inhabits. So nothing mystical about it. I always thought that there was maybe then three levels to heaven where God maybe sits at the top, and then there's a second level of heaven, and there's a first level of heaven. But that was just to say that I went to the place where God is. I wasn't in space. I wasn't in the sky. And so there are many questions surrounding heaven, and what it will be like, and what we will be like. And what I've done, and for those of you that have got lots of questions, you're going to have a lot of questions after today and after the series. I've compiled a list of the most popular questions that people ask about heaven and the answers the scriptures corresponding to them. And I'm going to give them to all the Homsa leaders, and you can make that part of your discussion. I'm not going to discuss all of it because it's a lot of questions. I'm sure you're sitting here waiting for me to get to some point that you have think, been thinking about for quite a long time. And so get to a home cell and you'll get some of the answers. Amen. It's impossible to cover it all. And I'll be honest, I've never been excited at the prospect of having one long eternal praise and worship session. Call me unholy or unspiritual. And for a lot of people, that is not wrong. It's heaven to them. The prospect of having a praise and worship session for all eternity. Now, all the men who look forward to that, put up your hands. Good for you. For us, most likely, we'll go fishing or do other things. But sometimes other people's excitement spoil it for us. Amen? So I might engage in a praise and worship session for a hundred years, but I'm not going to do it for eternity. And our minds can't fathom what heaven's like. I'm not excited at the prospect of a sermon for all eternity. I'm not, even though I preach sermons. But some people look forward to having a sermon by Paul and then by Peter 
and then by James, and then by Jesus, they look forward to the prospect of being delivered sermons for all eternity. I might do some of them, but not for eternity. Anyone looking to a ser- forward to a sermon for all eternity? Anyone? And these are the things that shape our thoughts and make us hesitant to venture into the area of what heaven could be like. I'm not excited to the prospect of being handed a harp and said, go sit in that cloud and play it. Because a lot of people think that's what we're going to do in heaven, is play harps all day. It doesn't conjure up feelings and thoughts of excitement within me. And at your response, I can see it doesn't do the same for you either. So why do we think heaven will be anything less than what God has taught us and put in us to love, to desire, and to experience good things? God says He gives us the desire of our heart. And heaven will be a place without sin. Heaven will be extremely, not extremely, it will be ultimately pure. Heaven will be a place where you'll be at your maximum capacity as a human being. Like we understand it now. It's not what you're trying to work this out. Are we going to be naked? I really don't want to answer that question, but when I read my Bible, it says that, that, that the angels handed out robes to people. So there's a lot of things that we can just, with common sense, try and reason and work out and think, okay, but you're not going to completely get all the answers. But we are using but a fraction of our minds right now. Less than 10%, some people believe. In heaven, you're going to have the full capacity of who you are. As Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, completely who God made them to be, you will be completely who God made you to be. Do you know... That heaven, not heaven, that the new Jerusalem, the city in which we'll live, the city which we'll inhabit, is about 2,300 kilometers long and it's about 2,300 kilometers wide and the walls are 65 meters thick and the wall goes up 2,300 kilometers into the sky. Now think about, that's the size of a city. India occupies about... 3,500,000 square kilometers. This city will be about 5,000, 5,500,000 square kilometers. The 2,400 kilometers is from here to Harare. That's the length of the city. Try and figure it out. That's just the city. There's not going to be a space problem. For those of you wondering, where's a, where's a couple of billion people going to go? The answers are in the Bible. It's a city paved with gold where pillars are made of pearls and where the walls are adorned and decorated in precious jewels. So if you're thinking that you might gonna be going to float around as, a, as, a, as an apparition or some spirit in the sky, heaven has physical attributes that we'll experience and enjoy. Speaks of rivers and trees. It's a physical place. Now me, when I get to heaven, I want to explore galaxies. I want to go see the depths of the sea and what's happening there. And I want to experience the wilderness and everything that God created and see animals that I've never seen. I want to explore God's creation. I don't know what that might be for you. Might be curled up with all the books of heaven in a corner somewhere. Amen. And all the introverts dead. Amen. Whatever what whatever ever whatever brings you joy and excitement if it's pure and without sin. 
That's what heaven will be like. The clue to what heaven would be like is found in the things that bring us joy here on earth. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity in man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. God has placed the longing for heaven within us already. The place where we will spend eternity. And there's a longing within you for this place called home. And it's this place where your longing is fulfilled, but it's also a place where everything that brings you joy and excitement and fulfillment is in the same place. A utopia that people speak of. Paradise. The Norsemen spoke of Valhalla, but we know it as heaven. A place that we look forward to. So the best way I can put it to you is that heaven, as the Bible puts it, will be an extension of earth. Or earth is an extension of heaven. You know, some of you are thinking, what? Wait, that's just us trying to, ah. No, the Bible says God is coming to come and live with us in the city of Jerusalem. In the new earth and the new heaven. Maar waarom sê gaan ons as ons Dood gaan. Well, there is what the Bible refers to, if you translate it, an intermediate heaven. Now, what's that like? I don't know. God can make it like He wants to. But there's going to come a point in time where there's going to be this earth, this heavens as we know it, is going to fall away. There's going to be a rebirth of the earth and a rebirth of the heavens. Much like you and I are reborn when we give our lives to Jesus, this earth as we know it is going to be reborn and you're going to see it in its purest form. What God made it to be like before we put our hands on it. But it's also going to be much, much more. The one thing that might sadden surface is it says in the Bible there's not going to be a sea. So I'm sure God can make waves anywhere He wants to. But those are the things that the Bible says. You don't need to tan. You're going to be your perfect self in heaven. Think of the times in your life where you were most fulfilled with joy, awe, and wonder. Think of the times I thought back of times as a child. My parent and my father, they eight children. And sometimes we would gather with my mom's family as well. Not very often, but when we did, the scenes of joy and the festivities of people gathering together around the table and kids running around and just this awesomeness of being together with people that we love. Think about those things that you long for here on earth or those things that bring you joy. And that's what heaven will be like. The Bible speaks of we will have feasts and banquets and gatherings. The things that we enjoy here on earth, everything that is good and praiseworthy and pure and without sin, those are the things that we'll experience in heaven in its purest form. So I ask you, what brings you joy and what brings you true fulfillment? Because if I'm going to give you my version of heaven and what excites me, it might not excite you. But I've thought up over the past couple of weeks while studying this, things that do excite me. And I'm really excited at the prospect of getting to heaven. Because the things I've seen and the things I've imagined and the things I've pondered on really do make me extremely excited to get to this place called heaven. But while that tarries, I'll work to bring heaven to earth. Use your God-given imagination to amplify and magnify the experience of what heaven could be like for you. The early Christians encouraged one another with the thoughts and talk of heaven, and we should do the same. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, it says, Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth, will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. 
And so encourage each other with these words. We should be having a lot more talk about heaven. And you should be gathering around as friends and family and as members of this church. And you should share your experiences and your thoughts and your hopes and dreams and expectations of what heaven might be like. And so allow others to do the same. And in the midst of that, you'll stir up in yourself an expectation and excitement for heaven. That's what the Bible says we should do. Encourage each other with these words. Our lack of talk of heaven comes from our lack of knowledge of heaven. You tend to talk about the things you most know about, that you have the most knowledge of, that you value the most, that you enjoy the most. that you seek for the most. If we should seek for heaven more, I promise you we would speak of heaven a lot more. And so I challenge you this week as you go about your life and as you go to home cells, speak and encourage to one another on heaven and what you believe it to be. Because you will not float around like Casper the ghost or be an apparition drifting about in heaven And we will be in our heavenly states as God designed us to be. And so I'm trusting God again for that eight-pack I had in matric. I'm going to see it manifest in my heavenly body. Look what the Bible says. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven an eternal body made for us by God Himself and not by human hands. That means your gym instructor has nothing on Jesus. Amen. And we grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing, for we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. Amen. We're going to recognize one another. Now, some people ask, what bodies are we going to have? And some scholars and learned people believe that we will be in the state that Jesus was when He left this earth at the age of 33. Others believe we will be maybe in the state of, let's say, 30, because that's the time when Jesus' ministry began. And it's proven that your body is in its most perfect state, has the most ability in the early 30s. Now, don't make that doctrine, but it's not a bad thought to think that if your body should have a state, then that would be the state at its optimum level. Your body responds and is at its best in its early 30s. Amen? Who's in their early 30s right now? Yeah, good job. And those that are not, you have a lot to look forward to. And those that are beyond 30, hey, good matikan. Doen wat jy moet, jy gaan hom terugkry. Amen. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh, but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God Himself has prepared us for this, and as a guarantee, He has given us His Holy Spirit. Why is the Holy Spirit the guarantee of what He's given us? Because the Holy Spirit has to be housed and clothed somewhere, which is the body. Huh? What say you, Pastor? I don't know if I think it's actually what's on the outfit of my blue outfit and act from off the MLT and act of my GC, what I don't drive. But I don't know if you say, the other say you can have a new body, a new body in its glorified state with abs and muscles and quads and your hammy gaan nooit weer trek nie. Jy gaan nooit weer uit asemheid wees nie. Jy gaan fix wees, jy gaan sterk wees. And so if we receive new bodies, it'll be in the likeness that we are now, we'll be able to recognize one another. Amen. 
people are afraid of these things in heaven one day, that we won't recognize one another, that we'll speak in tongues all day, and that we will, we will do super spiritual things that don't really appeal to a lot of people. But heaven is a lot more than that. Don't think that God, in all His wisdom and majesty and in all His creativity, hasn't give, given heaven a lot more thought than our limited thinking. And so the Bible proves that there will be culture and language and all kinds of things that we appreciate on this earth will be in the new earth. If the Bible speaks of a city, a new city, we all know what cities look like, don't we? Let's begin a eenvoudige voorbeeld. Ons weet wat stede en hoe stede lyk, is dit nie? Als gebouwen en paaien en mensen en dingen wat gebeur. So wanneer de Bijbel praat van die nieuwe Jerusalem, dit is een stad. Een levende stad waar een mensen leef. Voor eeuwig. En altijd. En jij gaan jouw plekje hee. Ek mag dalk in jou tuin wees, want ek het die genoeg vir die heren vir die nieuwe. Amen. Genesis 2, 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Our body, shaped by God, made by him, our form, made by him, only received life when he breathed his life and his spirit into us. He didn't breathe his life into, into the thin air, and there we appeared. He shaped us from the earth, and then he breathed his life into us. He breathed his spirit into us because his spirit had to be housed somewhere. And so we'll have a spirit in heaven. We'll have reasoning and understanding and emotion in heaven, only good ones, because there'll be no sorrow. There'll be no pain. There'll only be joy. The Bible says we'll remember things. You will not lose your brain in heaven. You'll have a super brain that works every time. Amen. Ever find that your brain stops working at the most crucial times? Your brain will work. And we'll speak. And we'll see. The Bible says the martyrs in heaven look down on earth and they ask God, when are you going to exact revenge on these people that are murdering and killing Christians? And God says... Just be a little bit more patient. Wait a little bit longer in due time. So it, asks, it answers the question of whether we'll experience time in heaven. Yes, we will. Then people say, but won't we get bored in heaven? No, you won't get bored in heaven because of time. Amen. The cool thing is that I believe we'd be able to do is we'd be able to see because God sits outside of the realm of time, we'd be able to go back in time and see how God made things and how, God ha how things happen. That's what I believe. And so, the people in heaven have an awareness of what's happening in earth, on the earth. So it's not some place where we absent from the things that we understood and knew in this place. But it will be all good and all perfect, and all pure. And so we had a body first, and God breathed His Spirit in us. And so our spirit will leave this earth, and will receive a new body, a good body. You'll be somebody. Amen. When Jesus gives the account of Lazarus, the rich man, and Abraham in heaven, He is not sharing a parable. He never gave the people in his parables names. He referred to them as a man or a woman or a king or a servant. And here he gives an account of something that actually took place in heaven. And these people were recognizable. They had awareness. And the rich man recognized Lazarus, the poor man that sat at his gate begging every day. And he recognized Abram. And he was thirsty and he desired to be comforted as Lazarus was being comforted. This, was, this man's experience of hell which is a very real place. You can't even say it's the opposite of heaven because we can't really understand how bad hell is because we can't really understand how good heaven is, but it's a bad place. And here this man was in his natural body experiencing pain and torment and thirst and being burnt by flames. And he says, Abraham, 
Lazarus, just give me a bit of water. He recognized them in heaven. We'll be recognizable. We'll have feelings and experiences. We'll be able to touch things and know things. And then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Our uncertainty about heaven is because of our lack of knowledge of heaven. The Bible has many clues that point to heaven being a physical place with many of the things that we experience on the earth. Why would God send us to a place that we have no knowledge and no experiential reasoning of? Why would He send, a place, send us to a place that's foreign to us? That we're not accustomed with. The Bible says we're going home when we go to heaven. And so I want to say this. The closest we can get to knowing what heaven is like is just think for a moment. What is the most beautiful place on earth you've seen? What is the most amazing experience you've had on earth? Because the best of earth is what heaven is like. And the worst of earth on the other side is what hell is going to be like. But I don't want to put the focus on hell, but just think for a moment. Think of the most joyous time you've had in your life. Think of the most fulfillment you've ever experienced. Think of the most beautiful places you've been to and what they've conjured up in your spirit and your emotions and what you felt like. Think of those things and then you'll only for a glimpse and for a brief moment know what heaven could be like. Because the clues to what heaven might be like are found here on earth. And yes, we've done much damage to this place, but there's still untouched places of immense beauty and power and majesty that speaks of God and His design. Think of some of these places. Think of some of these times in your life where you were most filled with joy, when you were the most happiest, where you were the most fulfilled, and that is what heaven is like. But times are changing because you'll be able to experience it in its fullness because you are completely who you were meant to be. God says there will be a new earth and a new heaven, meaning that this earth and everything that comes from it will be reborn. And this earth will receive its new body as well. And so everything that God made that is good will be reborn. It will be in its most perfect state. And we'll live in it. But He's going to bring His heaven to earth as well. So there's going to be much more than I do have time to explain to you. Will I see my pet again? Yes, the Bible points to that. That we'll live in harmony with animals in heaven one day. Michael for Lucky and Snoopy, we seen. Amen. The Bible speaks of us living in harmony with animals. One of the things that really do sort of gets to me is most likely we're not going to eat meat in heaven. So I get to what we're going to buy. And talk a milli. Brunte pot of eggs, but. But there's lots of clues in here, in the Bible about heaven. And those of you longing to see a parent or a child or a family member, you're going to see them. And you're going to experience them. And you're going to speak to them and hug them. They're going to be there. And everything that we long for that is good, we'll experience in heaven. It is a good place. It is an amazing place. No Hollywood movie can do it justice. And I've seen some movies on heaven. I thought, okay, they've tried. But it just won't do it justice. And so heaven will be everything and more. The Bible speaks of feasts and banquets in heaven, of mountains and rivers, 
of cities and trees and everything that we recognize on the earth today. It won't be a strange place for you. It will be a wondrous place for you. You'll be in awe every day for the rest of eternity at the things that you experience. The Bible says that God will be the light of this place and that Jesus will be the lamp. It says there will be no need of the sun and the moon. It doesn't say the sun and the moon won't be there, but the brightness and the glory of God will far outshine these things. We'll live by the light that emanates from God. There'll be no night. It'll be day. The Bible says that the gates of heaven will be on constantly open, so you would come and go as you please. If you wanted to go on an adventure with a group of friends, you can do it. If you want to go for a walk with that person you're so longing to see again, you'll be able to do it. You'll see them again. And heaven will be an amazing place. And hopefully for these brief moments, you've allowed your mind and your heart to just go there. Look what Revelation 21 in closing, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. And they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. Amen. We receive that this morning. Come on, let's stand to our feet this morning. I've gone... A little bit over my time, but there's much to say about heaven. More than I can cover for 52 weeks. But hopefully, and as you stand there, something inside of you has stirred. A longing inside of you has stirred for this place. Not only just to get there, but to experience it here on earth. Because that's the promise that God gives us. That while we long for this place, we can have aspects of it here on earth. So while we're standing, I'm going to ask that every eye be closed, every head bowed, no one looking around at this place. But I'll give you a word to Mark. I'll go to place. No one knows what I'm doing. I'll go And just for a moment, while you're standing there, with your eyes closed, with your heads bowed, no one looking, just for a moment, while you're standing there right now, just you and God, and as the Spirit of God moves in this place, just for a moment, I dare you to think and imagine of what heaven could be like for you. Just for a moment, just think of what that place could be, of what you would see and what you would experience. And allow your heart to go to a place where there's fullness of joy, and where there's peace beyond all understanding, where there's love incomparable where there's a freedom that you've never experienced where there's a fulfillment that you can't even fathom what it's like think for a moment what that place could be like while your eyes are closed I want to say to you that in that place is everything that you've ever longed for in that place is the God whom we serve that loves us beyond all understanding. In that place is Jesus and the angels. In that place is perfection. In that place is everything you've ever longed for. Now while you're standing in that place, and while you're standing in the presence of God, Imagine not having that place. Imagine not knowing that place. Because on the opposite side of that, there's a place that is devoid of all love. 
in which people are isolated and tortured and in despair, longing for the things that you and I will have in heaven. And there's a place where people find themselves, where there's no love, where there's no peace, where there's only pain and sickness and disease and heartache and longing and loneliness. And that's the place reserved for people who don't know Jesus. And I don't here to bring fear to you. I'm just preaching the gospel to you. And what Jesus says is that there is a place called heaven for those of us who have chosen Jesus, for those of us who live by faith, for those of us who the Bible calls saints, for his children. And sadly, there's a place reserved for those who do not know him. And so this morning, you have an opportunity to know him. You have an opportunity to guarantee that when you leave this earth, that you'll go to this place called heaven. You can guarantee your eternal existence in heaven. But you have to make a choice. Jesus said in his word, the reason why he goes is that he goes to go and prepare a place for you and me. He has prepared a place for you, but you have to choose him. Then you'll receive your place. There's a special place prepared for us according to our likeness, according to what brings us joy, according to what we love and what we appreciate. There's a place that Jesus has personally prepared for you and for me. And the way that you access this place, the way that you guarantee entrance into this place is by choosing Jesus. And so Jesus extends this invite to you, says, won't you receive me? Won't you accept me? Won't you enter into the joy of your Father where you'll hear the words spoken by Jesus who says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy that God has prepared for you. I don't have enough time and enough words to explain to you how awesome this God is, how great this Jesus is, how wonderful this heaven is. And God, I pray as you stand there, God will speak to your heart and a longing for this place will stir up in you and you could have a guarantee. The Bible says you must be born again. It's not enough that you grew up in a Christian home and went to church with your family. You have to choose this Jesus for yourself. You have to choose this Jesus. The Bible says you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you will be saved. It's a simple decision. It's a simple confession, but it has a profound impact in this life and in your life to come. And so isn't it amazing to know that a decision that you make in this earth and in this time that is limited, that is going to end, will determine your life for eternity. You can choose this morning how you live for eternity. This life is but a vapor. You have to live with heaven in mind. And so I extend this invite to you. Maybe you're standing here this morning, you're saying, I'm not sure of my salvation. I don't know if I should die today that I will open up my eyes in heaven. I want to make sure. I want to make sure that I'm saved. I want to make right with God. I want to receive my inheritance. Then all you have to do is say a simple yes to Jesus. It says you believe and you confess. And then he will come into your life. Heaven will be your inheritance. And he'll give you the means and the power to bring heaven to earth. But you have to choose. Jij moet kies voor ochtend. Ek kan het nie vir jou kies nie. Ek kan jou net bring tot die plek en sê kies. Wie die God is lief vir jou, wie die Jesus het gesterf vir jou, so dat jy die eeuwige lewe kan hee, saam met hom jyn dag. Maar so dat jy die lewe op aarde ook meer kan geniet. Hy beloof vir jou lewe, en lewe in oorvloed, wanneer jy jou lewe vir hom gee. Maar jy moet het kies, is nie genoeg dat jy sonnags skoop gegaan het nie. Is nie genoeg dat jy elke ochend die bybelverse gelees het nie. Jy moet hom jou verlosser en saligmaker maak. Jy moet die keuse maak. So at this moment, I want to give you an opportunity to make your peace with God, to choose Him, to choose eternity, to say, you know what, I want this. And I want to know that I can live a great life now here on earth, but I also want to know that when I leave this earth, 
most importantly, I'll have a place with God one day. So if that's you this morning, you're saying, you know what? I need to make this choice. I need to give my life to Jesus. If that's you this morning saying, you know what? Maybe I maybe once lived this life and the things happened and I walked away. And you want to come back? Then God says, come back. He's waiting for you like the father waited for the prodigal son. If that's you this morning, you say, no, what? I want to make sure of my salvation. I want to make sure of my inheritance. I want to make sure that heaven is my home one day. If that's you this morning, then I want to pray with you. J.C. Pastor de Sac, but some it may. If you're saying, that's me, Pastor, pray with me. Then right there where you stand, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, just lift up your hand high so I can see. Say, that's me. Lift your hand to us so that can see. Lift your hand high so I can see. Say, that's me. I need this prayer. I need to make this decision this morning. Lift your hand high so I can see. And there's a kiesse wat ons allemaal moet maak. Ek het drie kiesse gemaakt 15 jaar terug. And it's the best kiesse wat ek in my leven gemaakt het. And while you're standing here this morning, don't be afraid. Don't listen to your head right now. Don't try and figure this out. Don't try and figure out what is this man saying. He's speaking the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to you who says you must be born again. Je moet jou leven vir die Heere Maar is jou kiese. En God sê, ek plaas vir jou leven en doe het en hy sê, kies leven. And if that's you this morning, you're saying, you know what, I need to make right with God. As jy nie vrede het met God, dan moet jy jou vrede nou maak. So while believers are praying, if that's you this morning, you're saying, I need to make this decision, I need to make this choice, then right there where you stand, just lift up your hand high and say, that's me, pray with me, pastor. Me nie bang wees nie, me nie skaam wees nie. Lug jou hand en sê, dis ek dan. Bid saam met my. Bid saam met my. If that's you this morning, don't waver, don't worry. Just make this decision right now. Say, that's me. I need to make this decision. Lift your hand high so I can see. While believers are praying, while we're interceding for people, making decisions. If that's you, one last chance. I'm not putting God on auction, but this is a serious decision. Because the decisions you make today will determine how you live in eternity. So while you're standing here this morning, if that's you, and you haven't made this choice, you haven't made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, just lift up your hand high so I can see and say, that's me. Pray with me. I said, yeah, I said, yeah. But some of my, mark your freedom for him with God. Amen. Amen. Look up at me this morning. I'm going to ask us at this moment, because I do believe there are people that need to make this decision, and maybe you are shy or unsure of what's going to happen to you. I just want to say, in the presence of God, God's never going to do anything bad to you. He's never going to expose you, never going to harm you, never going to do funny, anything funny or strange to you. But I'm going to ask that all of us pray this prayer this morning, believing, because this heaven is real. And sometimes we live with a mindset that's so limited for a time that's going to end. Your life is so short. I saw a video clip the other day of a couple who were together at the Woodstock Festival. And they showed this picture and they tried to find these people. Where were they 50 years later? And to the amazement, this couple in this picture were still together 50 years later. And they asked them, what would you want to say to people? And they said they looked at the picture and they thought, where did time go? Because time goes by so fast. You're not guaranteed of anything in this life. And sadly, over these holidays, we've had to say goodbye to people. And people who were with us last year is no year, no longer with us this year. I'm not putting the fear of God into you. I just want to say to you, you have no guarantee of tomorrow. You have no promise of tomorrow, the Bible says. Make your choice now. Amen. So if you want to come and speak to us afterwards, you can come and speak to me. You can come and speak to me. But I want to make sure that you leave this place knowing that you're okay with God. Because there is a life after this life. And that the choices you make today determine how you live for eternity. Put your hands on your heart, all of us, and raise your other hand to God. And we're going to pray this this morning, believing. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died and rose again to give me life. And right now, Jesus, I receive that life. I thank you that all my sins are forgiven. I thank you that I'm washed in your blood, that I'm whiter than snow. And that from this moment, I am a child of God. I belong to you, and you belong to me. I thank you 
that you give me life, and life in abundance. I thank you that according to your word, I have a place in heaven that you have prepared for me. I thank you that you help me to bring heaven to earth. I thank you that right now you give me the promise of your Holy Spirit to come and live in and through me. And here is my life. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give God praise this morning for His Word. Amen. Amen. So don't